Hello everyone, my name is Marcel Bogers and I'm a professor of open and collaborative innovation at Eindhoven University of Technology. And I'm Marisol Menendez. I've been an open innovation practitioner for a long time. Open innovation is my passion. We welcome you to a new session of World Open Innovation Conversations. As you know, we meet with top leaders from academia and industry who are creating the present and future of open innovation. High quality conversations about what we love and with respected friends. What more can we ask for, Marcel? Uh, well, maybe we could ask for a bit more time in the day to have, have even more of these uh, interesting conversations. Um, but, you know, jokes aside, I think, as we like to say with these uh, conversations we're having, it's a bit of our own open innovation effort. And, you know, for me, open innovation is about knowledge flows across organizational boundaries. And here we want to bridge boundaries between research and practice as well, to explore new ideas and develop new insights that may inform and inspire academics and practitioners from industry and policy making. Marcel, this is our seventh episode. I invite everyone to listen to our previous chapters. We have three one-hour episodes, longer and with more detail, talking about grand challenges, innovation ecosystems, and ownership. Detailed conversations that you can also enjoy in video. Yes, exactly. And in our renewed efforts to develop shorter podcast episodes, we are engaging in personal conversations with top leaders in various domains. We see them really as conversation among friends, and, and but friends we admire very much. Now we're looking into the human side of open innovation, which is also the theme of this year's World Open Innovation Conference. This is a broad topic with many different angles to address, and today we have a new exciting one. So let's begin with the session. Today's episode is very close to my heart. And as you know, I began my work in open innovation from the corporation perspective when I created, defined and grew the open innovation unit at BBVA, the global financial group. That's where I understood the power of open innovation and the role that corporations can play in it. But also the various layers that come into action the strategy definition, the organization activation through the right processes and coordination with the right mindset, and finally, by articulating the right kind of connections with the outside world, participating actively and purposively in the ecosystem. Of course, as per open innovation definition that, by the way, you and Henry reviewed in your paper in 2014, a paper I really have close to my heart, this should also create and allow the capture of the right kind of value. That's why today's topic, the open innovation in ecosystems and organizations, in my perspective, is key. We are talking about the practicalities of open innovation within an organization, considering the human side of it. Yeah, absolutely. And in a way, in my own academic language, I could refer to this as well as the uh, the micro foundations of open innovation, by which I mean, for example, that we need to understand the actions and interactions on the individual level that will ultimately aggregate up to organizational level outcomes. And then, of course, we want to understand which condition, conditions will facilitate or hamper this process. So with that background, I am definitely looking forward to digging into this topic with today's guest. And for this, we move to uh, Salima Duven who is the Head of Open Innovation and Incubation at Henkel DX, the digital division of Henkel, a well-known German uh, multinational chemical and consumer goods company. I think we're all very interested in learning about how to open up such an established company. So welcome, Salima, to this episode of the World Open Innovation Conversations. And thank you for taking the time to talk with us today on this topic. Maybe in order to kick us off, could you tell a little bit more about your background and especially, of course, your work at Henkel? Yes, my pleasure. Hello, Marcel, and hello, Marisol. I'm very happy to be here with you and have um, the conversation. So thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, so um, I'm, as you said, uh, working at Henkel for a long time now. It has been now 14 years. And the majority of it I actually spent in the area of digitalization. 
I moved into that topic a little bit, um, yeah, uh, on uh, not not on purpose. So I slipped into it, I would say, uh, when there was an opportunity to switch. When I started at Henkel, I started in industrial adhesives, so in a very technical area. There in marketing, just coming at that uh, time from an automotive supplier. And uh, then I had very quickly the opportunity to switch to our consumer adhesives business and starting there um, a role that was named New Media. Yeah, that was 2010, so ages away. And uh, I had then the opportunity to start more or less from scratch to build up yeah, what at that time was important, so bringing the brands the traditional brands into the digital era. And from there, actually, my career was developing a lot. And of course, I was always riding the wave of digitalization and innovation because everything we did at that time was actually pretty pretty new and pretty innovative and brought me then, in, yeah, after many different role switches in adhesives um, to my current role, which is on a corporate level, working on open innovation and incubation for all of the three business units that we have, so beauty care, laundry and home care, but also adhesives. And yeah, I'm enjoying that a lot. So my background is um, business administration, focus on marketing. That is what I studied also some years ago already. And yeah, I'm enjoying a lot being in the digitalization. Great. And, and, and how would you describe your, your current role? Uh, I mean, as, as, as head of open innovation and incubation, right? That's what you currently are at, at, at Henkel DX. Uh, can you describe more about what that entails and, and what you do in that particular function? Yes, of course. So I would say this is uh, the dream job role that I can imagine because, first of all, I'm in the interface of working with our all of our three divisions, which is great. And um, so I have insight into all of the business units. And my role with the team together is that we are thinking about what are new digital business models we can think of um, to yeah, bring the business one step further and particularly looking into areas that are, yeah, I would say, either adjacent to the core business uh, or beyond the core business. Because, of course, innovation takes place at many different areas at Henkel and the business units are very innovative by themselves. And they have more this perspective of having a look what is um, yeah, core, uh, what's the core business and my team is looking beyond the core business and we are also very much pushing I would say new ways of working and how to bring in innovation processes to accelerate and to, to speed up. This is uh, great because I think that you are facing all the, these different layers that I was talking about the open innovation strategy for me is uh, something super interesting. Maybe I can begin with a first question for you. Um, how do you address or how do you perceive the open innovation organizational mindset? You know, of course, the organization is maybe not uniform. How do you make sure that there's the right culture? How do you work for it? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it is overall an evolution also when I'm looking how that was developing at Henkel. So when we were starting 2018 with the first uh, real setup of a corporate digital team, there was also a lot of efforts that we put in to connect startups with the businesses, for example. At the beginning, it was, yeah, well, a lot of effort that we put into uh, give the startups awareness and to uh, bring in our business colleagues that they can meet them and so on. So it was not something that was just um, yeah, rolling by itself. So it needed also a little bit of support. And also creating here that openness, I think, was one first step. And then we took it from there step by step further that we said, well, there's so much value into exchanging with others into tapping into an eco uh, into an ecosystem that um, I think the organization also further developed not only through our influence also through times are changing um, uh, much more exchange is happening also on a business level on the, on the social channels and so on and um, we had also great support of course from our um, HR and strategy team who was at that time then also rethinking what are our leadership commitments? What is driving us as company? And there were then um, commitments defined um, that are phrased like, 
well, we, we act as entrepreneurs. Yeah, we um, uh, emphasize a lot collaboration and so on. And there, there were many different initiatives and um, I would say little pieces that brings this organization into a more open mindset. And I think um, we were one part of it. Yeah, very interesting. And, and I think it's also interesting you mentioned the leadership aspect of it. Uh, and, and I mean, I think in itself it's, a, it's an important attribute when you want to go through such a process, of course, as you, as you experienced. Um, as, as I said a little bit earlier, I mean, I'm, I'm also quite curious, you know, given that this is quite an established company, has been around uh, for, uh, for quite a while. Um, of course, the, you know, Marcel's question was about, you know, the culture, the mindset and those kind of things. Um, I mean, sometimes we see that uh, sort of these large incumbent organizations, you know, can be slow in making that kind of change. Um, so I'm just curious if you can reflect a little bit more on that and maybe in particular on the role of, of, of leadership. How did you experience that and, and what role did that play in going through this type of transition or maybe the ongoing transition as you describe yes, it? Yes, absolutely. No, and you're right. I mean, Henkel is a very established company. We just celebrated our 146th birthday. So there you can see it has been uh, yeah, a long time on, on the market. And if I'm just having a look at the, at the last, uh, let's say, not even 10 years yeah, since I'm a part of the digitalization journey and the, the very first efforts that were put also on a very high management level that started already 2014, 2015 around, that really the leaders decided and said, okay, we, we should uh, much more strengthen our efforts towards digitalization. Let's have a look how we can collaborate here and how we can make that happen. And um, it, it took some time. That's also, I think, what you're referring to, that big companies sometimes are a little slower or maybe in our case, I think it's often that we would like to understand things very thoroughly before we are then going our path. And then our path is really the road that we are following very, um, yeah, um, I think, in a very strict manner. And I think here it was the same, yeah, that the leaders also went into a kind of role model um, position that um, we put it then also on the corporate strategy that we said well digitalization plays a crucial role and then of course um, every yeah top manager who is then also showing his examples and cases is really a great signal into the organization and we have many great examples where then out of the businesses great initiatives are coming up where um, brands that are very established and existing for a long time really come up with totally new digital business models and so on, like our brand Loctite. And um, that, I think, gives really the, the clear signal into the organization, okay, here is really change going on and is then also encouraging others to follow. And, of course, lots of communication um, is uh, yeah, part of that and accompanies the entire process. But without uh, the, the role models and the top managers, I think, uh, yeah, it's not doable. Absolutely. And you were talking about this almost 150 years old. Um, I also lived in a, or, or grew in a company with a deep history. Uh, maybe it's a good moment to talk also about the heritage dimension. No, what's um, this responsibility that you have to build over your existing history, but also look towards the future. How do we keep with the, the image, the tradition, the strength of what we have and use it to build the future? How do you find this um, in your own company? I think in our company it's super interesting because when you go back into our history and you look at how Henkel actually was starting, uh, we were really starting as a classical startup uh, almost 150 years ago, yeah, because our founder had really a very problem based insight. He wanted to ease the way of washing, which at that time was very hard work, very um, physical hard work, and uh, was then inventing the first um, washing soda and was developing that and bringing that into the market. And he really started with uh, more or less himself and, and one employee. So he really started from scratch. 
And it was so interesting. Uh, we, we are running um, our yearly exathon that is a business hackathon that we are doing for female startups. And last year I told exactly that story that this big corporation, Henkel, with its more or less 50,000 employees, really started as the founders of these startups that are very early stage are also starting yeah, with a great insight, uh, with a problem they want to solve, and then with a product that they are launching. And I think that that gives us such a strong connection also to innovation and to also reinvent ourselves, because throughout this 150 years, we needed to do that a lot, of course, um, to still exist and to still be very successful. And we're very sure that yeah, we have the capabilities to continue doing that. Yeah, Having a look, what are the challenges that we are facing today, What is, um, what is driving the markets and how can we actually um, yeah, come up with new ways of managing that and ensure that uh, we are further existing in the hopefully next 150 years. So that gives us a lot of, I would say, um, yeah, a lot of power and a lot of motivation to further go our way. I think in general, it's interesting to see, of course, where such a company is coming from. Also think about many other examples like here. I'm, I'm in Eindhoven here. You know, I'm working at the university, which exists because of uh, the company Philips, which started with the with the light bulbs, uh, let's say. That would be the short uh, version of, of the history, of course, now more in the healthcare domain. Uh, and, and there are, of course, many more examples. But looking at also thinking of this kind of example, um, um What I see in these kinds of companies, also in the current day, if we fast forward to uh, to today and the future, I think it's also very much about, um, and you mentioned that already before, about managing your your ecosystem or or, or developing it, uh, and that can of course be defined in a very broad way. We don't have to elaborate too much on definition, but of course it's about you know what are the different types of organizations that you are working with in order to jointly develop a certain type of value proposition, for example. So, uh, I mean, I think you know, this is much more dependent on that kind of constellation of, of uh, different actors, let's say. Um, that uh, I think that is seems to me one of the of the challenges going going forward. And my, my, my question to you is, Uh, how you link all these elements that we're already talking about also in the context of ecosystems, right? If we talk about, okay, how do you change as an organization, but we talk about mindset and culture and leadership in the face of ecosystems, this becomes even more complex, right? Because you're also not only depending on change in your own organization, but also what's happening in all those other organizations. Is, is, is there a way, you know, that you are approaching that in terms of how you connect that or, let, you know, even what is the human side maybe of e ecosystem management? Uh, what is your experience with that? Yeah, that's, that's also a very good question. So, I think for for my area, so when when I'm working in open innovation and incubation, um, I think for us it, it was very important to keep up with the organization and to push for let's be more open also what are our challenges and what are our concepts and so on. And I would think that years back it was more this kind of, well, we are not exchanging with others on what are our challenges or we are not naming them. Of course, there were always exchanges with, um, uh, with, with partners or with providers and so on, um, but more on a very formal level. Yeah? And I think now it is that, well, for example, we um, had once uh, a period in, in the business where we said, well, let's bring in external mentors um, that help us to work uh, on certain challenges. Now it was that we said, well, let's really go into the ecosystem that's important for us. So therefore we opened um, in Berlin an in, in innovation hub so that we can also be more where for us, let's say, the, the music place, let's say, in, in Berlin, where also lots of different other corporate peers are, where uh, many startups are, so that we have there also a go-to and a very nice place where we can also mingle and where we can also meet other people. And I think also bringing in the spirit of not being in this closed communities, yeah, that we are sharing with others what are we working on. And I'm not talking about that um, we are sharing here, I don't know, the, our secret formulations yeah, or, or some kind of uh, patterns that we want to register, nothing like that, but more in this area of early on exchanging with others about um, topics that are driving us. I think that's... That's a big game changer. And then also incorporating this feedback and um, reaching out maybe to interesting other 
companies, uh, corporate peers, where we think maybe that is an interesting um, yeah, connection. Uh, who knows what kind of maybe cooperation will come out of that or not. Um, so let's keep it very open, but do much more on this kind of exchange um, level. And also in, in this regard, seeing also our innovation process and um, having a look at a certain point when for us does it make sense maybe to think about what kind of startup could we cooperate with in order to jointly further develop an idea um, is also something we are taking now on a much more strategic level into consideration than maybe we did um, uh, years, years back. So many, many different dimensions, um, I would say, but this topic of that an ecosystem is important and that times are over where you are just, I don't know, invent yourself in the little labs, the great ideas, I think that is pretty clear now to everyone. I think in the practice of connecting with the ecosystem, um, this exercise of being really aware of what kind of collaborations will be um, fruitful and long lasting, you no, know, is is important. You no, know, this uh, awareness of saying, okay, who is the right partner for me to collaborate with, either startups, universities, researchers, or whatever. But also, I think it's interesting to understand that the open innovation process within the organization is not uniform. You no, know? even you have business units who are maybe closer to the day-to-day -day life, and others who are looking more into the disruption or whatever. And you need to be able to 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 connect with each of the partners and do each of these parts of the open innovation process in their own different way. And um, I think it's part of the magic of the orchestration or the role of the open innovation orchestrator within the organization to, to help to understand this and maybe measure and, then, uh, and, and project it within the organization. Also to show to the organization the value that we are creating with the open innovation process. You know? And here I think we connect also with the business model and how we capture value and how do we show the value that we are capturing to the organization because we we want to have our stakeholders aware of the value that is being generated here. You no. Know? So for me, the question in this case would be how do you make sure that we are uh, that you are maybe um doing the right kind of value capturing with all the processes or how do you manage this within Henkel? And maybe if you have anything related to the KPIs or how do you work with this <laughs> in the organization? I know it's a big question, by the way. This is kind of my obsession <laughs> right now. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's a very, very valid point because the topic of what kind of value are we generating is a super important one, yeah? Because you can have... I don't know, the greatest innovation unit at all if, uh, if it's not bringing the value and then the question is, or the, yeah, what, what is the definition of value? Because often that's also what I'm experiencing is that those kind of units are too often compared to the traditional business and that you then put KPIs towards the innovation units um, that actually is part of the traditional business and there you can never compete with. I can never compete with when I'm launching something from scratch, a new digital business model, I cannot compete with um, a product that is launched in the traditional channels where we can exactly forecast what the, uh, what the uh, revenue will be and so on. So we need to put a different mindset on, that's for sure. And on the other hand side, I think we also need to have clear KPIs so that we can also sort out what kind of innovation in initiatives are we following on and are we pushing further and where do we also stop because also this is something I have seen too often that projects are somehow pushed through and carried through the the process even though you would think mm, actually we need to stop that yeah but then you have people that are so passionate about it and so on and uh, then it's, it's very difficult sometimes to get the thing stopped and therefore we said well we need to have a clear KPI process throughout our innovation process and um, the first thing we are starting with is really when we are going into research and ideation is that we're saying well we, first KPI is we need to have a really a compelling 
problem statement that is very clear and then we go into the solution mode and we are then generating ideas and yes we are also looking into okay how many ideas uh, could we generate in a certain period of time yeah we are wor working very time boxed so also that timing how long it takes us is a KPI we are looking at because you can always dig deeper and you can do more research and you can do another ideation round and so on. At a certain point, the results won't get better and uh, yeah, swoops, six months are done or are over. And therefore we are saying, no, the first phase of research and ideation should not take longer than, let's say, on average kind of six weeks. And then after that, we should have a, real, a really good um, Uh, problem statement and uh, ideas and then we can move if that's then um, yeah positively acknowledged then we move on to the next phase of prototyping and there we are then also going already into a kind of um, yeah soft testing yeah then we are also checking back and, and um, launching for example some kind of um, teaser websites and have a look at first conversion rates and so on depending on what uh, the initiative is so then we are trying to really put quantitative KPIs behind that prove whether the prototype is, um, uh, is something that uh, the target group wants and so on um, and we are also already calculating a first market potential so that's also how we are then having a look at the portfolio of all of our concepts because we don't want only ideas that are in a very uh, niche area where you would say well in five years our revenue potential is I don't know five million then that is nothing that um, is super interesting and compelling let's say for the company so We, need to have, we can have some smaller uh, initiatives, no doubt about that, but then there should be also some bigger initiatives in. So um, the first uh, market potential and revenue potential we are calculating early on, of course, on a very rough level. We need to then detail that throughout the phase, but uh, doing that in a, with reasonable numbers is actually just possible when you really launch your MVP and you really bring the product into the market. And then we have a look also into, um, depending on, again, what it is. If it's an e-commerce topic, then we are measuring typical things like average basket size and order value and so on and customer life cycle uh, value and all these kind of things to judge whether it's uh, possible or uh, yeah, something that we would like to further pursue. So KPI is very important for us, no doubt. Yeah, we are very clear. I think that you know the process is also clear. Um, what, what comes to my mind is a, maybe try a quick question before I think we will be wrapping up the conversation. Is I'm just curious um, if you have any say systematic way to also um, assess those projects, let's say that you discontinue. Uh, right, because also in an open innovation logic, we can often talk about you know things that you actually not do, uh, and and then see is, is there still a way to work with them to put them you know in the market or through startups or do you have any any approach of 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 working with with sort of say you know failed uh, projects along the way? I like that thought a lot because I think right now we are probably putting them too much or too deep into this kind of draw of well these are the discontinued topics and we are not looking at them regularly again that's probably something we should do because we are putting this decision uh, we're, we're um, putting the basis on uh, the three lenses of desirability feasibility viability and if one of those is not really compelling then let's say we say mm, yeah then probably we should not take it to the next phase But then we leave it there and then for now, because we also need to balance our resource, uh, we are focusing then on the next topics that potentially we would like to do. But I like the thought of going back from time to time into more or less the backlog of discontinued topics and put them out again and check whether maybe the market conditions have changed, the user behavior has changed. Um, or we found new ways of, uh, I don't know, making it more profitable or whatever. So far, we did not do that that much. Um, but that's a very good uh, inspiration. Yeah, thank you for that. I love that you brought that up, that point, Marcel. You and I had several discussions about this before. And I call this the circular economy of open innovation because we are not maybe aware of the value that comes from the discard. So looking forward, any news or any ideas that you get from there also, Salima. That was just a final tip 
tip the tongue on my side. Yeah, sure. <laughs> no, I, I, th- I mean, I, th- I think we can uh, k- keep uh, discussing for a long time. But as I, as I mentioned, probably it's time to uh, to wrap up here. And I'm actually I want to give maybe the also that says the the word to you, Salima. Maybe you you know, do you have any sort of final considerations or a way to for your perspective to wrap up our conversation or your experience in this domain in general? Yeah, I think overall, I think we are on the same page knowing or saying that innovation and open innovation in particular and digitalization is a challenging one Yeah, because the, the rules are permanently changing. It's getting more difficult with all what's happening in the world. And on the other hand side, I think for us as, as companies, but also for us as society, keeping up innovation, I think, is the only way to master all of the challenges that we are going through as a society. So I think we need yeah, courageous people in organization that are also yeah, getting or, or are not getting frustrated if things are not working maybe out as we all would like to have it. And that's also another part of innovation that we just talked about it, that you need to stop things, that not everything is a success and so on. And here having courageous people that also yeah, um, go further their way, that are very um, also... Yeah, that that are that really like to make the difference, even though it means okay, you cannot um, maybe work in in your own silo. You have to go out. You have to connect to people. Um, forget about perfectionism and so on. Yeah, so rather get things out and and try, experiment, and learn and those kind of things. So therefore, that that I would wish for um, other companies, for our company, to further go that way in order to yeah really give a big yes to innovation and um, find out what what will help us for the future because that's ultimately i think what what counts so yeah great that would be great. my wrap up yeah thanks yeah so i mean uh, i think that's a very also optimistic uh, closing and, and 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 i think you know this is what we should all uh, aim for aim for from uh, you know our respective uh, perspectives um you know from my point of view i think you know we in a way we address many different types of topics you know and try to discuss how they are connected my wrap-up of your wrap-up is that in the end it's very much about the people as you say uh, the people will make the difference right this is why we talk about also the human side of open innovation uh, so when you want to bring together all those you know different stakeholders across organizations but also within organizations manage those processes you know that human side is really uh, critical in making that uh, happen so yeah thank you for that um uh, marcel i think that's it uh, for today um i think we could continue this discussion for many hours and i'm also happy to say that salima in fact is one of our keynote speakers at the world open innovation conference so there we can discuss this topic and many other ones in related to the human side of open innovation or any aspect of open innovation you want to discuss Uh, we can do that right there with many leading academics and practitioners as well Oh, yes, and I'm looking to meet with so many people that have the right kind of mindset at the World Open Innovation Conference. I'm, and I'm also looking forward to our next podcast episodes, Marcel. I'm really enjoying the process of recording and speaking with so many good friends. I advise everyone to stay tuned because we will have great guests. Yes, absolutely. And what we will do is you know, we'll continue this uh, thread. We'll have diff- different uh, discussions on different topics with different people all connected to open innovation, including the human side, but we'll surely also move beyond that and explore other topics as well. Don't forget to follow us in our webpage, worldopeninnovation.com, Twitter, LinkedIn, and all your podcast channels like Spotify, uh, Amazon, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Yes, and to conclude, uh, thank you again, Salima, for taking the time. Uh, It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you.
You're welcome. And big thanks to our Woik team and Jacob in particular, who is uh, turning the knobs behind the, the, the scene to make everything happen. So thanks so much for the dedicated work uh, in that respect. And thanks to everybody who's listening. Um, and we'll see you again next time. Thank you and goodbye. See you, everyone. Thank you, Salima. Thank bye you. bye. Bye bye. Bye.